uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, saying that we live in truly unprecedented times is probably understatement. So, uh, to analyzing uh, markets, analyzing uh, data is a very uh, difficult uh, process. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Not only that we have to make sense, but we have to make money. In order to make money, we work with the best in the city. And actually, today, it's my pleasure to uh, I introduce Jeremy Stretch, who is uh, Chief International Strategist at one of our partners, which help us actually delivering uh, through these times. Uh, Jeremy, uh, we know each other for a very, very long time. He is a specialist in interest rate space and uh, FX. I have nothing else to probably to add. Jeremy, please welcome. Uh. Thank you very much, uh, Slav. So just to sort of reiterate that uh, that welcome from uh, from Slav. Um, it is very much the case that uh, I work from CIBC, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, here in London. Um, we've worked with Slav and his colleague uh, Charles Thompson uh, from Crown Agents uh, for many, many years. They've been very good and very solid partners with us, and we're looking forward uh, to extending that partnership uh, under the momentum umbrella as we move forward. So I think thank you for the invite to this conference, and hopefully um, I can add uh, a little bit of insight into uh, how we're viewing the market uh, space and the market outlook uh, from a CIBC perspective. I'm going to run through a number of slides. Um, there will be a lot of information on these slides, but I gather the event will be videoed, and uh, you will be able to subsequently see some of the slides if you uh, need to get a little bit more detail uh, after the event. Um, and then I will take some questions at the end of the session. So. I was asked several months ago by uh, my friends at Crown Agents if I would be uh, happy to uh, present at this event. And I said, of course, I would love to, love to speak. Um, and then when I looked at the agenda last week, I realized I was uh, uh, speaking under the title of soft landing, hard landing, no landing. So I thought, ah, OK, that's perhaps what I should uh, start to speak towards and maybe uh, having a think in that particular context. Because, of course, that is the important driving factor which is really Im influencing investor decisions as investors are trying to understand and, and, uh, and uh, evaluate how the central banks are uh, moving through this uh, unprecedented degree uh, of monetary policy tightening. And of course, today of all days, when we've got, uh, I think, something like six central banks uh, of major uh, standing uh, announcing rates, including, of course, the Bank of England here at midday, and of course, also uh, the Saab decision coming through today as well. And we had the Fed last night. We have the Bank of Japan tomorrow. So it is very much an appropriate time just to try and uh, determine whether the, uh, the cup is indeed uh, half full or the glass uh, half empty. So in a sense, just looking at the, the, the graphic uh, in the context of uh, the, the first chart, uh, the first slide there, we are in that scenario where we do have this inflation bubble, which has really inflated over the course of the last couple of years. That's really been sucking uh, the oxygen out of the global economy. And what the policymakers are trying to achieve is moving from that right-hand uh, cartoon through to the left to encourage the economy to, to grow, but also dealing with the inflation problem along the way. Now, the question is, can we find that uh, landing zone? Well, here I am uh, channeling my inner Top Gun, uh, just looking at uh, trying to land on the aircraft carrier. Um, looks as though the conditions are pretty calm, uh, the sea looks pretty, pretty benign, and ultimately looks relatively easy. Now, in a sense, I think it's worth just scrolling back at just a little bit and just a touch to remind ourselves about what the world was like pre-COVID. Now, it does seem like an almost a different environment to go uh, all the way back to 2019. But when we were going back through the period of 2019, we had this uh, scenario where there was some discussion about this concept of st secular stagnation. Now, that's something that uh, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers has talked about and had uh, highlighted for a number of years. And Larry Summers is uh, someone I'll come back to as we move through the session. So we had that sort of scenario or discussion about the prospect or risks of a secular, secular stagnation through the latter part of the last decade. So that was sort of characterized by prolonged low growth, low rates, and of course, unemployment was in places somewhat high. 
Now, of course, we've moved well beyond that, and so we are now in this situation where we're in this post-COVID environment where we've seen spikes in inflation, we've seen growth uh, materially compromised, and the question is, can we find that sufficient landing zone? So in a sense, from that very benign backdrop that we had in that sort of uh, cart or the, the picture in the previous slide, we now have a situation where I'm now trying to fly my plane into the sun. So slightly less easy to land on that aircraft carrier. Uh, in a sense, if I really wanted to torture the metaphor even further, um, I'd probably start to suggest that it should be in the dark and perhaps I should be uh, trying to land a helicopter onto a, a sw um, serious swell. Because in a sense, that's the real problem that the policymakers are having to deal with. They've been playing catch up over the course of the last year or two. And of course, it is very much the case that we had this situation where during 2021, when we did see some of those inflationary pressures starting to build, many central banks, not all, but many central banks were very reluctant to start to adjust policy. Now, if we just look back at the charts and we look back at inflation, you can say, well, clearly central banks were far too relaxed, far too reluctant. Uh, to start to tighten policy during 2021. We've moved through the first phase of the uh, COVID crisis, and perhaps we needed to consider uh, the uh, need or requirement to deal with some of those inflationary dynamics. But of course, it's easy to look back with the benefit of hindsight and say that central banks were complacent. Because if we scroll back to September 2021, the RBNZ, who are one of the leaders in terms of the advocation of monetary policy tightening, were due to hike poli policy, or at least were expected hike policy, uh, almost exactly two years ago. But at the last minute, they desisted because they were suddenly concerned about the re-emergence or emergence of COVID in uh, the South Island of New Zealand. Now, I think actually it ended up as being one case, but that did prompt the central bank to row back from policy tightening. Now, it only meant one meeting, but nevertheless, one meeting means a slightly longer period of inflation growth before central bank policy started to rein it in. So, in a sense, I have some sympathy for the central banks in terms of this perception of them uh, being complacent during uh, 2021 into the beginning of 2022. Uh, and of course, we had the situation during the latter part of 2021 and into the beginning of uh, uh, last year, uh, when we did still see many, many central banks arguing that the inflation bubble was going to be merely transitory. Now, I think it's very interesting just to try and understand and determine what central bank, in the language of a central bank, what uh, uh, complacency, uh, or sorry, what transitory actually means. And I think it was quite interesting, Andrew Bailey, the governor of the uh, Bank of England, uh, in a Treasury Select Committee hearing a year or so ago, when asked to define the definition of transitory in central bank terms, his response was, anything that isn't permanent, i.e. that can be pretty much anything. So that's not exactly a particularly strong degree of confirmation in terms of the central bank reaction function. So they were deeming anything that wasn't permanent as transitory. So in a sense, then you come back to the nature or the discussion about whether uh, central banks were a little bit complacent um, in terms of that transitory narrative. Now, what we've been seeing over the course of the last uh, few months in particular has been central banks trying to bear down on inflation. Now, I think it's quite interesting, just looking at the, the uh, cartoon here on the, uh, on the, left, uh, the bottom left of that particular slide. Um, hopefully, many people know who that cartoon is of. Anybody prepared to venture as to who that is? One of the most famous central bankers of the 1980s? No? Volcker, Volcker indeed. Paul Volcker. Um, the most famous cigar-chomping central bank manager of uh, uh, central bank uh, uh, governor of uh, the past uh, couple of decades. Um, now, in the early 1980s, he had to deal with an inflationary problem very similar to that that we've witnessed over the course of the last year or two. So he was trying to prick that inflation bubble. Um, now, I did look at that graphic and see that he was, a, as I say, a famous cigar smoker, as he did, uh, appearing in front of uh, various uh, Senate committees. Um, I did look up the uh, top 100 uh, cigar smokers, and unfortunately, he only came at number 78. Um, but the most famous cigar smoker, according to that list, was uh, Winston Churchill. He did come in at number one. And I think it's interesting because, of course, then I looked at quotes from Winston Churchill, and he did reference the fact that those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And in a sense, that's appropriate in the context of the Volcker era because, of course, we saw Volcker tightening policy very, very aggressively, as we've seen from many other global central banks over the course of the last year or two. 
But in the context of that particular cycle, he did end that policy tightening a touch too early, and that encountered or encouraged another rebound or an acceleration in inflation. And I think that's the, the lesson from history that we might be need to be mindful of in the context of this particular policy narrative. And in a sense, I think it's quite interesting listening to Fed Chair uh, Jerome Powell last night, because I think he is a little bit of a student of uh, Fed Reserve history, and I think he is mindful of the uh, risks of easing policy too soon. So the mantra from last night's uh, Fed statement was very much higher for longer. And I think that's uh, quite uh, interesting and quite appropriate. And I think that is a, a benchmark I think we should be considering uh, for all global central banks as we move forward. And using the central bank or national bank of Poland as a little bit of a uh, canary in the coal mine, it's quite interesting that they were very aggressive, an early adopter of monetary tightening. But after 12 months of aggressive policy tightening, they are one of the leaders in terms of reversing policy. So I think there's going to be a situation where we can have maybe uh, 12 months of uh, tight uh, and elevated monetary policy. Now, just looking at that sort of repeat from history, in fact, um, I will just come back to one part of this particular graphic, which I think is relevant in terms of the history. So looking at that uh, Volcker era in 1980, 82, uh, we did see the need to bear down inflation uh, from the peak very aggressively. On the right-hand side, that's the current cycle and our assumption of the degree of compression in terms of inflation from the peak. So it's smaller in this cycle compared to the Volcker era in the early 1980s. But the important point and the important differential is in terms of those black bars in the context of the impact that that has on the unemployment backdrop. So we are an anticipating a degree of unemployment increase over the course of this deceleration in global activity and that tightening monetary policy backdrop. But the scale of the unemployment uh, accumulation or rise in the unemployment rate is going to be substantially smaller in this cycle, according to our estimations at CIBC. And I think that's very important when we come back to answering that initial uh, question of hard landing, soft landing, or bumpy, or no landing. Because I think if we are going to see a much smaller degree of uh, rise in unemployment in this particular cycle, then I think that does encourage that narrative of a much um, softer landing than perhaps we might have been uh, used to in, the pr in previous cycles. Now again, coming back to the context and concept of Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, this is a chart that he put out uh, across the, uh, uh, the media a month or so ago, looking at the parallels in this inflationary cycle compared to the early period during that Volcker era and the uh, spike in the oil price. And the comparisons are relatively compelling in terms of uh, the policy uh, dynamic, in terms of the inflation backdrop. Now, I think it's important just again to repeat the, the issue that Volcker eased policy a little bit too quickly, and so that encouraged a little bit of a spike in inflation, which required or necessitated a second bout of monetary policy tightening. So that, I think, is why we will see central banks maintaining the higher for longer uh, mantra. So I think there's certainly a, a question or a, an issue in terms of that particular context. And so the question is, are we going to see this uptick in inflation either as a context of central banks easing policy too early. I don't think that will be the case. But there is this secondary issue that we've been seeing over recent weeks, and that comes back to the issue of the rebound and the rise in the oil price that we've seen over the course of the last few weeks. Now, we've seen, obviously, production cuts being announced by Saudi, by um, Russia as well. So the level of um, um, volume or flow coming through the market has obviously diminished. Now, obviously, there are big uh, demand dynamics at play as well. And of course, we've seen uh, further weakness in terms of the Chinese macroeconomic uh, narrative of late. But we have seen oil prices obviously moving up quite substantially. And one of my uh, equity derivatives traders has been consistently telling me for at least three months that oil was going back to 100 bucks. Now, on Monday morning, I was starting, starting to feel rather uh, queasy about the risk of oil going back to 100 bucks. We have come back a little bit. Uh, and I think it is very much the case that perhaps the oil price dynamic did look a little bit overbought and we were getting uh, a little bit excessive. And I think the question from my perspective, and I do uh, have the privilege of uh, going to speak to investors in the Middle East quite regularly, so trying to get a, an interpretation or an understanding of how they view the energy market. And I think there's been a recognition or a desire for a defensive strategy, so i.e. reducing the degree of production in order to maintain a floor uh, and encourage the revenue streams to remain elevated, rather than necessarily trying to drive the oil price beyond $100 and really beyond that, because that would run the risk of really 
further compromising the global recovery narrative. And that, of course, would then start to have a material and deleterious impact in terms of the revenue streams. So I think it's more of a defensive strategy from the oil producers rather than one where they're de definitively trying to drive prices higher. So I'm not convinced, despite my equity derivatives traders' uh, con conviction, that oil prices are set for this exponential rise which would create further inflationary, uh, further inflation uh, dynamics and further inflationary pressures. So what about, what about the inflation variables that we have been considering? Now, of course, we have seen key dynamics in terms of the COVID reopening. We've seen, uh, obviously, uh, influences in terms of uh, the supply chains being compromised. That's been a function of uh, the broader sort of policy dynamic. In this particular uh, context, I've looked at the uh, New, York, uh, New York Fed uh, global supply index and then overlaid that against US inflation as an indicator or a lead dynamic in terms of some of those price pressures. So it was very much the case that as we reopened gr progressively during 21 and into 22, we saw that global supply, global supply price index moving up uh, very significantly. That really led to that sort of flow through into the broader price dynamics. But those global supply chain influences in terms of the black line there have come down and come down quite markedly. Now there is and has been a little bit of an upturn in terms of some of those global supply uh, side dynamics over the course of the last few months. But I think it's interesting because of course I didn't put these two graphics on the same uh, axis. So if you're actually looking at the right hand axis, we are still talking about the global supply uh, chain index effectively in negative territory. So there is still a continuation of the sort of the base effects which will be benign in terms of the um, in, in terms of the supply side, in terms of uh, the sort of the cost dynamics. So that helps to alleviate some of that inflationary pressure. So we're seeing global central banks tightening policy to try and suck out demand, but also on the supply side through the supply indices, we're seeing less uh, pressure coming through. So that really sort of adds to the sort of the question as to what are the other influences that the central banks are really mindful about and should be concerned about as we move forward. Well, of course, one of those remains the impact of second round effects. Now, this is something that the Bank of England here are very mindful of. The ECB are continuing to be concerned about it, as we are in most other developed markets as well, and also in terms of the emerging sphere also. It's those second round wage effects that have really been uh, quite significant. So as we've seen this, obviously, this inflationary cycle, we've seen uh, a requisite increase in wages. And so we've seen a little bit of a sort of an imbalance which had been very much in favor of the employer versus the employee over the course of the last two decades, which have meant that uh, wage growth had been relatively contained and hadn't really been a driving force in inflation. We've now seen a little bit of a switch around in many markets over the course of the last year or two. And so workers have been able to demand and bid up their wages quite significantly. So here we are in the UK or in the middle of a, a strike by doctors, for example, who are currently trying to demand wage growth or a wage pickup of up to 35%. Now, one suspects that eventually the resolution of the uh, negotiations between the government and the doctors will not result in a 35% uplift in wages, but there is going to be a substantial increase in wages in the UK from the, wa from the doctor sector, and that is requisite of uh, wage growth that we're seeing in other particular markets. But going back to that earlier slide regarding about the degree of destruction in terms of the labor market, we're not seeing the degree of uh, job losses that we have seen in past cycles. So that's also providing a sort of resilience in terms of the labor market. But I think one other factor which I think is relevant in terms of the labor force and in terms of labor force dynamics is the changing nature or the changing composition of employment and employment growth, which I think has also had a little bit of an impact in terms of some of those wage dynamics. And I think in this particular context, it's very notable that a couple of markets on the left-hand side of that particular graphic, so Japan and the UK, where there's either negative um, labor force growth or negligible labor force growth. Uh, and when I did have a, I had this chart uh, previously at the beginning of the year, the UK was also negative. We have seen a slight uh, uptick as we've seen an increased degree of migration from uh, different parts of the world outside of the European Union. But there is a real dislocation between labor force growth in certain markets, and that's amplifying some of that wage pressure or wage growth, so particularly here in the UK, 
in Japan, it's quite interesting because, of course, wage growth is the key and important benchmark that the Bank of Japan are looking for. And, of course, the Bank of Japan are a complete monetary policy outlier as it stands at the moment. But there is this sort of recognition that there is this real divergence in terms of uh, labor forces, which I think have uh, played out into that sort of uh, broader policy narrative. So... We've seen a cycle in terms of policy tightening that we haven't seen since the 1980s. So as I say, we've you know, seen the National Bank of Poland being the first to, or one of the first to turn the rate cycle after 665 basis points, I think it was, of uh, tightening. Um, but we've seen aggressive monetary policy tightening in many, many jurisdictions. So obviously, the ECB have gone from negative rates in terms of the deposit rate from minus 0.5 up to 4%. We've seen the Bank of England going from 0.1 to 5.25, at least before today's decision. We've seen, obviously, other central banks moving up, South African Reserve Bank getting up to eight and a quarter, for example. But the question is, how do the central banks calibrate that? Because, of course, in normal cycles, you wouldn't necessarily expect such an enormous and substantive degree of successive policy tightenings. Now, we've seen or we'll probably we'll see a 15th straight increase from the Bank of England today if, if the Bank of England follow through. We've seen progressive and aggressive tightening with very uh, short periods of uh, policy pause from the Fed, and we've seen that reflected in terms of many other central banks as well. So there hasn't been this ability to tighten and then see how the impact of that policy tightening has worked through. So in a sense, that brings me to this concept that uh, Milton Friedman uses of the context of the fall in the shower. And in the context of that, then we are seeing those central banks continuing to turn up that dial in terms of monetary policy, saying, well, it doesn't seem to be working. It doesn't seem to be working. I keep turning on the tap. And eventually, at some stage, the water will come out of that shower head boiling hot. Now, that, in a sense, is the problem that all global central banks are having to deal with. But I think we are now getting to a situation where, in most instances, I think most central banks are at or pretty close to terminal rates now. And as I say, for most of those, that probably means they will maintain a degree of uh, restrictive policy for a period in order to facilitate a squeezing out of uh, inflation from the system. So coming back to the, the sort of the initial question, are we going to return to the 70s, which of course was hyperinflation or relatively high inflation and relatively low growth in that context of stagflation? Well, I'm not sure that we are going to get back to that. As I say, most central banks are getting pretty close to the end game. The BOJ is still the outlier. Perhaps by the end of the year, they may start to consider their own uh, policy adjustment. We've obviously seen the Fed moving pretty expeditiously. Do we think there's going to be a recession in the US? No, we do not. We think the risks of that are certainly somewhat overstated. But of course, if, you're looking at, if you look at the yield curve in terms of the US, then that very much indicates that a recession is coming. And we've seen um, that uh, very much uh, highlighted even before uh, the COVID crisis back in uh, 2020, when we saw uh, the yield curve uh, moving into uh, an inverted bi uh, bias. Did we think that was signified in the recession? No, we did not. Now, we thought that was a little bit of a false flag. I'm not sure the bond market could necessarily foresee the arrival of COVID. I think markets are relatively, uh, relatively good at clearing information, but I'm not sure necessarily they're quite that prescient in terms of being able to see uh, a global pandemic. But I think we are uh, in this situation where we are still in this uh, inverted curve uh, backdrop, but I'm not sure that's going to create a recessionary backdrop. And then, of course, there are other factors to consider, including demographics, which I think are particularly interesting as we move forward. So just talking and looking at the U.S. yield curve. So as I say, we've had this protracted period of uh, inversion. So uh, front end rates well above uh, the back end in terms of longer rates. So uh, an inversion in terms of the term premia. We have obviously seen that remaining in place over the course of the last few months. Now, the bars here represent the recession bars uh, as appropriated by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Now, we have obviously seen some fairly significant recessions over the course of the last uh, two to three decades. We would think that this uh, inversion in the yield curve does look a little bit aggressive, particularly in the context of the macro assumptions that we're working with. And that comes and brings me on to the actual numbers that I'm having or we're running within CIBC in terms of the growth trajectories. Now, it is very much the case that if you're actually looking um, at the right-hand side there and you look down the column of 2024 relative to 2023 and certainly uh, relative to uh, 2019, it is going to be a situation where growth is going to decelerate in pretty much every single market that we're looking at in the context of next year relative to this year. 
Now, of course, that's partly a legacy of the monetary policy tightening. The lagged effect of policy tightening is working through the system. That will have an impact on consumers, and so that is going to um, maintain that sort of uh, moderation in terms of activity. But importantly, there are no negatives in there. But that's not to say that for the individual person, it may well feel rather more recession-like, because if you're seeing growth of 0.1 or 0.2 in the UK or the Eurozone, that's going to be pretty tough. That's a pretty uh, lackluster environment at best, and for some it will certainly feel rather worse than that. Now, I think the other important dynamic just to consider there is just looking at the bottom line there in terms of China. Well, we're cautiously optimistic in terms of the China story. We don't think that that 5% growth target will be met. And you can actually say, well, four and change doesn't feel like a particularly strong recovery. But I think it is quite sort of worthwhile just putting that China growth narrative into context. Because just looking at those red bars there, looking at the growth uh, trajectory of China going back over the course of the last uh, 30, 35 years, if you actually aggregate the average level of growth over that period, it's just shy of 9%. You can say, well, going back to that previous chart, if we're seeing growth of under 4.5% in the context of both 23 through to 25, then we are also around the 4.5% across that period, we are seeing growth of half the sort of trend rate over the course of the last 30 years. But what I would say is that if you actually look at that growth in nominal terms, over the course of the last 10 years, nominal Chinese growth has doubled. So we are seeing a much bigger, bigger, uh, much more important trajectory in terms of the uh, nominal dynamics, which I think are important. So we're not necessarily tremendously bearish on China per se, even if that growth trajectory looks less robust than we might have uh, previously assumed. So what can go wrong? Well, still quite a bit, unfortunately. Excessive rates by central banks, so if we're wrong to say that we're close to the terminal rates, should we see oil prices push beyond that $100 threshold that uh, I touched upon, then clearly that will be an, a scenario. The Fed obviously remains mindful of a potential policy mistake. If the Fed were to push through at least another hike this year and beyond that, then that would be uh, certainly uh, taking policy well into restrictive uh, dynamics. We expect actually the Fed to be uh, unhold on current levels through the course of the rest of this year and only progressively cutting rates through the course of next year. There are question marks about QT because, of course, we've seen central banks not only tightening conventional policy, but they're also draining liquidity out of the system. That, of course, is an un, uh, unprecedented scenario. So there are issues in that particular regard. There are other factors at play to think about in terms of the context of 2024, because, of course, we're moving into another key electoral cycle, not just in the UK here, but also particularly in the US as we move into the primary season from the beginning of next year. And then, of course, as I say, demographics, I think, are particularly important because in many developed markets, aging populations are going to have an important influence on both the scale of the labor market, but also in terms of uh, consumer expenditure. So I picked up this graphic um, looking at the glass uh, half empty and half full, and then I suddenly realized once I put it in that, in fact, the glasses aren't the same size, which is slightly unfortunate. Um, so that, that, in a sense, uh, kind, of, kind of slightly stacks the deck in terms of the context of the uh, slightly more downcast viewpoint there. But I think, actually, despite the disparity in the size of the glasses, I'm naturally a more cautiously optimistic uh, soul, and, and that, that ties in with the narrative that we have uh, from CIBC's perspective as well. So we are thinking that uh, inflation is going to remain relatively benign. It's going to take time to get back towards that 2% threshold. It's probably going to be uh, 24 or more likely into 2025 that we start to see uh, any numbers with a 2 a handle on in terms of the broader inflation backdrop. But I think we are getting to a scenario where the central banks are nearly done with, hi with their hiking uh, narratives. And that, in a sense, should be more encouraging for risk. It should be more encouraging for equities as we move through uh, next year. And if we start to think about if we were standing here in 12 months' time and we were seeing that progressive uptick in terms of growth trajectories into 2025, then I think that's also encouraging for those high beta com commodity or growth orientated currencies or markets that are very much uh, correlated in that particular direction. And then just finally, just one final slide, which I think is always interesting uh, because my background is from the FX space. And I think it is just interesting just to remind ourselves about the global uh, FX landscape. We still have this situation that the very dark blue uh, component of the, uh, the pie chart still dominates in the terms of the context of global reserves being denominated in US dollars. But that component is progressively on the reduction or is being, is being reduced. But the uh, opportunities or the options in order to move away from dollars 
are still relatively small. We've seen, obviously, the euro having episodes where there's been a significant degree of accumulation in terms of uh, FX reserves, and I deal with many global central banks who've uh, been uh, considering both uh, upping and reducing their euro reserves over the course of the last uh, decade or so, particularly uh, during the eurozone crises and the negative rates trajectory when we did see euro holdings revise down sub substantially. But I think the other interesting dynamic in terms of the context of China, we have seen central banks considering increasing their uh, reserves in the CNH, but there is still a limitation as to how far they can go. So the subtext for me is that, yes, the dollar is going to remain that um, re global reserve currency. Its status is probably not going to be threatened, uh, certainly in my lifetime, perhaps even not in my working lifetime, depending on how long CIBC keep me, keep me in, uh, in operation. So I think that's just worth just putting that out there just to, uh, to sum up and to conclude. So ultimately, I think the glass is still, as I say, half, uh, half full. I think there is and are still opportunities. I think growth uh, will progressively recover over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And I think from an asset market perspective, that does still provide uh, reasonable scope and opportunities uh, to move forward. So with that, I will conclude and open up the floor for a, a few minutes of uh, questions. Um, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>